Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Wong. I'm a senior director at the World Economic Forum. I have the pleasure to introduce uh, this session. Uh, the reason I'm here is because at the World Economic Forum, we have also been struggling and looking at the challenges related to infrastructure as one of our initiatives for the last several years. Most recently, we have an initiative called the Strategic Infrastructure Initiative, which is building on the momentum that a lot of uh, discussions from the G20, from leaders such as our panel here today, have been struggling to solve the infrastructure puzzle. And we have an initiative that is specifically looking at how can we create new models of collaboration between business, government, civil society, experts, We've already done some analysis to really dive down into the project preparation and the global financing challenges. I'm sure we'll hear more of this in the session today. And we are right now working very closely with the Africa Union Commission uh, and the NEPAD, uh, NEPAD uh, Planning Coordinating Agency and the African Development Bank with a specific deep dive on Africa, looking at how we can leverage the World Economic Forum platform to help with Africa's program for infrastructure development in Africa, the PETA program. Uh, as an example. So uh, I have some more information on this. It's all material that's also available on our website related to what we're doing on infrastructure. But we're very pleased to uh, have you learn more about that, but at the same time now to introduce our panel and hand over to our moderator who will take us through our session this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, and thanks for joining us uh, this morning, folks. Um, infrastructure, as we all know, is a key issue uh, whether we are in the mature markets or uh, in the growth markets. Um, whether it be infrastructure financing um, or whether it be the, the regulatory and institutional issues uh, that we need to deal with uh, around infrastructure, or whether it comes to efficiency and innovation uh, that's fundamental and critical to unlocking value from the investments that we make in infrastructure, uh, this is a topic that's, uh, that's near and dear to, to all of us. Uh, we have uh, a distinguished panel uh, joining us uh, this morning. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Sushil Kumar Modi, the, uh, uh, the Deputy Chief Minister for uh, the State of Bihar. Um, um, there are some amazing things that are happening uh, in the State of Bihar um, under, under his leadership. Uh, we have um, uh, Dr. Marafi, uh, Group CEO, uh, QTEL Group uh, out of Qatar. Um, uh, and and the QTEL group is doing very interesting things um, in the communications and telecommunications uh, space. Uh, we have uh, Lu uh, Xiaoguang, uh, President and CEO of the Beijing Capital Group. Uh, and as we all know, infrastructure financing is a key topic, and, and we look forward to hearing uh, Mr. Lu's uh, views on it. Uh, we have um, Honorable Minister Johnson, Minister for Communication Technology uh, from Nigeria. Um, and, uh, and we also have uh, Dr. Raymond Chen, Chairman uh, MTR Corporation. Um, without much ado, let me, uh, uh, let me uh, hand over to uh, Mr. Modi uh, to share with us some of his thoughts uh, on the issue around um, you know, infrastructure financing, which is a big topic for all of us. Oh, friends, uh, India is going to invest more than one trillion United States dollar in the next five years for infrastructure. The big question mark, the big question is from where this one trillion money will come from. And we are struggling how to finance the infrastructure projects. So in India, we have uh, encouraged public private partnership projects in infrastructure. And a large number of projects are being taken involving the private sector. And then the central government, the federal government, it is funding those unviable commercial projects. Uh, the federal government is funding 20% of the capital amount as a viability gap funding. But the biggest problem we are facing is the insufficiency of user charges because uh, the people are not ready to pay user charges. People are poor, they are illiterate, and there was a, a legacy people are not paying for the user charges. So this insufficiency of user charges, then the government of India has set up an India Infrastructure Finance Company Limited. And this company, IIFCL, will fund 20% of the total project cost of the infrastructure projects. 
and then we have also set up uh, infrastructure debt funds and through this these infrastructure debt funds we are going to finance our big infrastructure projects and the government of india has also allowed certain companies to float infrastructure bonds in which uh, there is a income tax exemption to a certain limits and we are also contemplating to use foreign exchange reserves for infrastructure development but still these public private partnership projects are at the very initial stage and slowly and slowly the companies are coming in the private sector because the finances of the federal government or the state governments are very limited to finance these big projects and there is a kind of explosion you can use the word explosion of infrastructure now there is a there is a hunger people want good roads people want connectivity people want uh, good uh, uh, urbanization and and all these things require a huge amount of money and because of the present fiscal framework it is difficult for the federal government of the state governments to arrange money for such infrastructure projects so we have gone for this public private partnership but still it is in the very initial stage and uh, uh, i think uh, 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 india is trying very we are moving very fast and in a backward state like bihar which is one of the poorest state of this country which i represent in the in a state like bihar we have attracted, we have attracted more than 2000 crore rupees in the road projects so uh, the biggest hurdle how to manage uh, how to uh, how to this uh, user charges and the large number of uh, private companies should come forward to participate in the public private partnership projects thank you thank you very much uh, uh, mr modi um let me uh, let me hand over to uh, to to mr marafi dr marafi to talk about um some of the issues that he is facing perhaps from a regulatory standpoint which is seemingly is a big issue for the telecommunications industry yes uh, thank you very much uh, again just to introduce uh, our company Qtel of course is one of the big telecom companies in the region in fact we operate both in the MENA and the Asia subcontinent and we have roughly 17 operation now with 85 million customers and as you know you mentioned we have some issues that that need to be addressed in our industry as you are aware that you know telecom uh, industry is actually have been the driver of many of the uh, new you know uh, growth in in the industry and one of the major challenges that we are facing is that you know we need to finance the next generation of building this infrastructure as you are aware the mobile penetration now in the world is around 80% which is actually where people actually have access to mobile phone than any other technology whether it's electricity or even banking account so in a way we are going to be at the center of uh, you know of the world economy uh, especially in the coming uh, age but to do that of course we will need to invest even further in uh, in the technology that is, is is going to come which is again to support broadband in particular the, the the issue that we are facing is that you know of course mobile penetration is very high the growth that is coming in the future is going to slow down uh, as i mentioned because of the high penetration yes there are growth in data but the margin that comes with data is also very low in comparison with the previous so that is going to require you know for us to find a way to you know uh, to invest in the infrastructure and that is going to require some understanding from the regulator and also from government that there need some kind of support for uh, you know for building that infrastructure the you know the issue that we have is that for example we are seeing you know many countries now are imposing a new fees on the spectrum especially for the new generation which is called LTE uh, and that is going you know to be one of the issues the other one is taxation you know operators are putting taxes you know on telecom services and we which we believe that need to be looked at the other thing i think we need also to work you know with other players in the industry especially the ott players or the content provider because we believe that should be a, a partnership you know model by which you know we can share you know on the pie that is going to grow you know especially that is coming with data so these are some of the issues that we are facing and i know that you know it's going to be interesting to understand from the government you know how these issues are going to be addressed and you know we are you know in a way trying to also facilitate some of these discussions you know in some of the forums that we have you know especially you know the world economic forum i think could play an important role 
there are other forums like the ITUs and the GSMA that also playing an important role to bring all these parties to understand the challenges you know that is going to take our uh, to take into our industries. So again, it's going to be interesting to see you know how we are going to fund this future infrastructure. And again, as I said, you know that's something that needs to be uh, you know uh, debated and uh, you know discussed with the regulators. Thanks, thanks, uh, Dr. Marafi. Um, uh, let me hand off to to Mr. Liu. Um, clearly, China has made amazing, amazing progress on the infrastructure front. Front. Uh, it'll be good to understand from your vantage point both the finance dimension and and the regulatory aspects uh, of how China is progressing on this very important topic. Okay. This is a large city investment. Uh, we are kind of uh, very big uh, infrastructure operator, and we invest in a lot of uh, infrastructure products, including the metro products, uh, the wastewater treatment product, etc. And we think that for the infrastructure industry, it really develops toward the high consumption oriented industry. So, in terms of the investment, it's going to be in large scale. So what I want to say about uh, the innovation in terms of financing for basic infrastructure, because in the past, investment in infrastructure is done by the uh, revenues from the uh, land and also rely on the loans, and this investment is actually paid by uh, made by the government. So it's the government who are doing multiple functions to issue the bonds, uh, to purchase the land, and also to make the investment, while for the enterprises, uh, they are not the main bulk of the investment in the uh, infrastructure. But I think when we talk about the new form of financing, we're going to involve a lot of enterprises. We would uh, involve a lot of players. The government is not the only one, the only player that making the investment. More, we have a lot of agencies, for example, bonds, securities, and big investment companies are all participating in that. We will mobilize more social resources in terms of the operational model we actually would go for the market, that is, the, to break up the monopoly and rely on market forces. Secondly, there are many new ways of financing. So we hope that we can leverage that kind of ways of uh, financing, for example, the PFI, to form this kind of SPC company to provide service and product, and the, com and the government will purchase the service. Another is PPT. This is another way. We think it is also uh, meaningful. So together, we are working with the uh, MTR of uh, uh, Hong Kong in that form. And recently, we're also thinking that in China, we'll mobilize social capitals, using as social uh, companies, for example, insurance companies and security companies, so that we work together for a big infrastructure fund. We are now working on two funds. One is a small and medium-sized town investment fund, and another one. These uh, will be made for big and large-scale infrastructures. In addition to this kind of fund, we are also thinking that in the future, we will use a capital market, bond market, and debt market for financing. We are still thinking. And also, in the future, the investors will have to construct some platform with a financing field so that information would be more symmetric and there is a flow of information. So in the future, making investment in infrastructure, we can do this kind of option of uh, the projects. That is, people, they have the projects, but they do not have fund. Where other people, they have fund, but they do not have projects. So in the future, there will be a kind of a trading platform so that these two parties can be matched so that the basic infrastructure can have more source of funding. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Liu. Um, uh, Minister Johnson, um, Minister for Communications Technology, there's amazing things happening in the in the telecommunications uh, space in, in Africa, fundamentally changing the fabric of society. It'll be good to get your perspective on this topic. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, there are amazing things happening in, in Africa, in Nigeria, particularly with communications infrastructure. But I think, as has been said, and some of the statistics show, the, um, the lowest level of investment from government is coming into the communications uh, industry. And that's because for many countries in Africa and developing economies, 
that industry has been very much liberalized. So a lot of the investments in communication infrastructure is coming in from the private sector. Um, and these are, these are huge investments that are required. And so the role of government really becomes uh, much more emphasized in terms of creating that enabling environment for private sector investment, either in the form of PPPs or private equity or, or whatever it is. And so the, the regulator and, and government really becomes quite important when you talk about creating that, uh, that environment. And there are many aspects of this that, um, that we see. I think what investors are looking for in any, before they invest in infrastructure, which are really very long-term investments all across the world, they're looking for some level of predictability, some level of consistency, and where possible, some level of standardization uh, in, in the industry. And those are the kind of things that we are worrying about as we try and attract investments into the, uh, into the ICT industry, particularly for building out our broadband infrastructure. Uh, talking about predictability, for, uh, for many uh, telecoms companies, the biggest investment is in broadband. And for broadband investments, the biggest uh, cost is, is right of way. And what we've been doing in Nigeria is trying to ensure that we standardize how you procure right of way. So, for instance, um, there's right of way on federal roads, on state roads, on local government roads. And we've been able to achieve quite uh, significantly a standard cost on the right of way on federal roads. Uh, not only a standard cost, but a standard amount of time. So by the time you, uh, it's only, it would take you 30 days from submitting your application for right of way to actually receiving a yes or no or whatever on, on the right of way. These are very important because these are the key things that actually constrain or, re, or slow down uh, the um, investments in communications uh, in infrastructure. And I think one of the big strategic shifts, and that's what we're talking about, that we are seeing or that is important, is the collaboration of, uh, of, of, of government agencies because, again, you know, I, I am talking about ICT infrastructure. But what you find is that that is infrastructure that requires uh, regulation across several uh, MDAs, ministries. Uh, the Ministry of Communication Technology itself, uh, Ministry of Works, because of the right of way across uh, on, on roads. And for us, for uh, installing base stations, we now have regulation around the Ministry of Environment in terms of the impact of these uh, very large uh, um, uh, structures in our urban cities and in some of the rural areas as well. And what needs to happen, and, and is happening, is that there is much more collaboration. So, for instance, when I talked about standardization and some consistency and predictability and right of way, we had to work very closely with the Ministry of Works. As we go into more and more base stations, we have to work with the Ministry of Environment. So having a, a sort of one-stop shop, if I can call it that, for, um, for regulation and for, and for permits, uh, for building out very important ICT uh, infrastructure. Um, I, I think that one of the other things that, uh, looking at institutions, particularly coming from um, uh, um, Africa, which is becoming, I think, just like most other parts of the world, quite regionalized. So there's the ECOWAS community. And, and what needs to happen is that as we build this infrastructure, particularly for the landlocked countries in the ECOWAS um, region, we need to begin to take this infrastructure to some of these, these countries. And we need to begin to look at regionally integrated infrastructure. So there are a number of projects that are uh, power projects that are regional. There are um, water projects, ICT projects that are regional. But the important thing is to begin to um, combine these uh, regional uh, uh, infrastructure projects. So for instance, there is a, um, a, a, a Trans-Saharan uh, communications, uh, uh, um, there's, sorry, there's a Trans-Saharan power line there's a, there's, a, there's a project within ECOWAS to connect all the capital cities in ECOWAS through fiber. But what we're also doing there is that we're riding on the power uh, infrastructure. So we're putting fiber over power lines. So that not only having regionally integrated projects, but having integrated infrastructure projects that are riding on the same infrastructure, riding on the same permits, riding on the same regulation, I think that's a very important way for governments to start thinking uh, in terms of both the investment that is coming into the countries and also in terms of accelerating the build-out of that very important infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Minister Johnson. Um, uh, Raymond, uh, clearly um, the issue of pricing, the issue of um, you know, financial sustainability is a topic that's top of mind to, to many of the panelists. This is an area where MTR has done really interesting work. It will be good to get your perspective. Oh, yeah, well, I think um, just a little bit of boosterism for... MTR to start with. We're probably the most uh, profitable subway company in the world. Last year we reported profits of close to two billion US dollars. But coming back to something that is broader, okay, I think essentially infrastructure to uh, modern urban living 
It's like water to life. Both are scarce resources. Uh, both need careful management, and both need to be kept evergreen. Okay, the tension arises when, in a lot of political communities and a lot of societies, people tend to think or take infrastructure and water as something that is given or an entitlement. Okay, so there's a tendency for politicians to sometimes sort of adopt popular. Um, uh, populist rhetoric and saying that these things should be given free, okay, and that's a fundamental tension that needs to be resolved. Okay, infrastructure um, like good water, fresh water, um, basically have the characteristics of the public good. Okay, so it really justifies appropriate government intervention and involvement. But from the MTR experience, is that government needs to be there at birth. However, I think it would be prudent for government and its sound long-term policy, economically and politically, to think of how you can eventually extricate yourself. Okay, and um, so the way that the, the the MTR business model is such that okay, the basic premise is that you know that if you build a railway with the right alignment, it actually enhances the value of all the contiguous land, okay? and you can create new communities. So it actually generates a lot of external economies. So if you can set up the rules of the game such that the builder of the railway or the builder or the developer of the infrastructure, some of that enhanced value added or value created can accrue or be internalized by the developer. Okay? That solves a lot of your long-term problem. Okay. And the way that we sort of look at MTR now is that 30 years ago, we thought of MTR as a rail service company. Okay. Now more and more, we look at MTR, successful commercially, but MTR more and more, we look at it ourselves as a platform, okay. a platform like a Google, a platform like an Apple, where not only would you put all sorts of applications onto it, lifestyle, residential development, retail, okay? We also put electronic money, uh, Octopus Card, which is quite well known even beyond Hong Kong. We're one of the world's innovators in using a card as money. And that's applied not only to transportation services now, it's applied to retail. Um, and. Um, and we're also now actually in our space uh, to today, actually property development accounts for roughly 40% of our profit, 20% from rail operations only, it's profitable, 20% uh, from station commercial. So rather than it's just the selling the tickets, the fares for train, we develop our stations such that it becomes community space. Okay, we bring art, we bring retail into station. And then on top of stations, we have bigger retail, we have restaurants and all that. And so we use other people's ideas and apps and bring it onto our platform and can generate more revenue. Um, and another 20%, so I said 40, 20 from rail, 20 from station commercial, advertising and all that. And these all need to be planned before you actually just go there and build a station. For instance, we're now um, building the Hong Kong sector of the national high-speed rail network. Okay. There's going to be a very large terminal, all underground, five layers underground, right by the harbor front, okay, where the future West Kowloon Cultural District will be, the museums and all that. We're talking to developers and designers of the museum. Okay. Our station actually is going to become an integral part of that museum. People come off the train, they're going to be greeted by artwork. Okay? There are going to be community small performance areas and all that, where we're going to draw the community into the stations, do performance, make, uh, 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 make your sort of really a commuting experience more like a lifestyle experience. Okay? These things need to be thought out well in advance. Okay? However, Okay, coming back to the very basic okay, principle is that one, as I said, 
It's a public good. You have to think of how to allow developers to internalize the external economies generated. Another thing is that we've always abided by it, and this is something, a challenge faced by a lot of Western communities now that are sort of finding their uh, 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 infrastructure in various states of disrepair, is that uh, um, you need to abide by the user pay principle. So you need to have market pricing. Having said that, infrastructure providers, service providers also need to be caring companies and then working together with government is that you really need to help people who truly need help. Okay? So you can be quite generous if you have targeted subsidy for people who cannot quite afford the essential infrastructure. Okay? Um, but you need to be very careful in terms of very broad-based entitlement programs. Okay. Uh, I think everywhere you go in the world, including Hong Kong, if you're over 60 or over 65, you virtually enjoy free fare. Okay. However, I think for the panelists around here and all that, sometimes you feel, is it right not to charge them anything to write the MTR? Yeah. Um, so I'm about to reach that age. <laughs> I might have a change of mind then. Okay. So it's this kind of um, um, thinking you really need to have the community, engage the community in debate and discussion, and try to abide by something that is economically rational, but at the same time also caring. Okay? I'd like to um, end by bringing up an, another issue, is that uh, because I think since 2008, we know the world, the global economy is in a troubled state. Okay? My own view is that we need to be 21st century Keynesians. Okay? We need to massively, on a global basis, invest in infrastructure, and we need to invest in education. Okay. These are all things that have very long-term payback periods. Okay. And as a consequence to the excesses of the banking community and financial intermediary services before 2008, okay, rightly so, global regulators are reacting. Okay. But one of the unintended consequences of maybe overreacting is that new regulations around the world, Basel III plus all sorts of other regulations, are making it more challenging for financial intermediaries to fund long-term projects. Okay. So this must be addressed, uh, especially for commercial banks. I think no commercial bank in their right mind these days will think about doing that much project financing. Because on one hand, they need to, the regulators are telling them to increase capital. Another hand is their, their liabilities is getting shorter and shorter. But so they're really, in terms of the asset side, their horizon, they're shortening their horizon. So how do you address that issue and uh, uh, set up things and maybe you can think about maybe insurance industry can fund certain long-term projects, but they're also subject to increasing regulatory restraints. Okay. I think this is something that global regulators and government needs to think about it carefully. Uh, 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 otherwise, um, because if we do the judicious investments in all these essential infrastructures now, I'm quite optimistic that the new normal that the whole global economy is transitioning towards can be quite a bright new normal. But if we fail to do that, if we fail to do that, the new normal can be something that is reduced uh, compared to the final two, three decades of the 20th century. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, Raymond. Uh, any any follow-up comments um, based on what Raymond said, um, uh, particularly Mr. Mr. Modi, the, the the whole you know issue, and I'm sure um, um, Dr. Marafi would you know would would uh, raise this issue as well. Um, Given the, the long-term nature of the investments that are required to be made in infrastructure, financing is going to require having the right kind of regulations to actually make the whole investment worthwhile. And the big issue, for example, in the telecommunication space is, the, is this 4G technology that's coming. And the question would be, Dr. Marafi, you know, you know, clearly telecommunications has driven extraordinary things, whether it be the Arab Spring uh, in the Middle East or transformation uh, in ECOWAS in Africa or, or empowering uh, the common man in, in places like India. The question is, 
what kind of things can governments do to ensure that additional investments continue to happen in areas like 4G and 3G and technologies of that nature uh, to the point that Mr. Raymond was, uh, was making, which is fundamental for the future of, of entire societies. Yeah. Is it to me? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, because if we look at the cycle of investment that need to meet in telecom, in the past, you know, the life of these assets would go from, you know, 10 to 15 years in, in terms of the investment, because as you understand, you know, investment in telecom is capital intensive. It requires a huge amount of funding. So the operators was able to justify, you know, the investment because the life cycle of the technology was longer at that time. What we are seeing now that this cycle is shrinking. You know, for example, you know, we have seen that 3G technologies today, you know, it was introduced in the late 2000. And more or less, the cycle is getting shorter for 4G. We expect that to be less than 10 years. Now we're talking about maybe five to eight years. And that is going to require as big of an investment as we used, uh, you know, in 3G. And yet, you know, as we're seeing that the government also are imposing the same taxation regime, as I mentioned, you know, in terms of, you know, royalty fees or, uh, you know, uh, what they call license fee that has been imposed, you know, on the operators. And what, as we are seeing that, you know, even though the spectrum is more or less available, uh, there is, you know, tendency in the government to impose, you know, more, mon more money on the operators, you know, to invest in this, uh, you know, spectrum, even though it doesn't cost the government, you know, that much. Again, I was interested, you know, to hear, you know, the minister, which was very interesting to see, and I hope that is followed by other countries that in Nigeria, they have been very supportive of the operators, and we see that this regulation is better for the industry because the industry already is very competitive in nature, and you don't need to do a lot of regulations, you know, in the industry. And that is going, you know, to help the operators to go at least to be more proactive in making the investment. The other issue is that, you know, whether subsidy is going to be needed in our industry, I think that is not needed at this stage, given the government reduced taxation, and also, as I mentioned, you know, to reduce, you know, fees that they are going to impose, impose especially for the 4G technologies. Um, um, from the, from the audience standpoint, um, are there any specific questions that you'd like to ask uh, off, of the, uh, off of the panelists? Please, please get your um, you know, questions uh, ready. Uh, I just have one other question for um, um, either um, um, Minister Johnson or, uh, or Mr. Modi. Um, when we think about in infrastructure investments, there are some areas where the private sector is able to step forward, and that, you know, whether it be telecommunications or electricity or highways and ports and so on. In public-private partnerships, Mr. Modi, the thing you're talking about is, is pretty much the order of the day in most parts of the world. But there is a whole bunch of other types of infrastructure where the primary investment's probably going to come from the public sector, from the governments, whether it be water, waste, urban um, mass transit, what are the plans for addressing that kind of infrastructure? Again, they're absolutely fundamental, but unlikely to be addressed by the private sector. No, see, the, we are also facing these problems because the private sector is still not ready to come in the urban development or especially in the water supply, in the, sewerage, in the drainage and sewerage system of the urban areas. So there are many areas. The private sector is more interested in the uh, infrastructure of telecommunication uh, still people are coming the roads, but still there are large sections of the infrastructure in which uh, the private sector is not finding it convenient or finding it uh, remunerative uh, to go into those sections. So for that we are arranging funds through uh, this uh, what you call uh, by setting of infrastructure debt funds, raising money from the market, raising money from the people. But still, these are the issues. And one more issue I would like to uh, raise here, regarding the maintenance of the infrastructure. The infrastructure is aging very rapidly. So, uh, how to maintain, how to sustain those infrastructure which has been created? Because normally the government does not spend much of the money on the maintenance of the infrastructure. In a country like India, it is aging very rapidly. So that is one issue. And another issue I would like to raise here, uh, regarding this in telecommunication, how this telecommunication is going to affect the health of the uh, common man. Because in the recent 
uh, magazines, newspapers, it has come appeared that the radiation of all these mobile towers and all these things, they are affecting the common man health. To, to what extent uh, we are taking care of these things? Because in India we are new to these things, but I would like to know if somebody from in the panel from the uh, uh, developed countries, they can uh, answer these some questions. There's, there's, there's a lot of, um, clearly there's a whole bunch of um, uh, in, um, really smart thinking on this topic in the, in the audience. Anyone who would like to ask a question or, or make a comment? Uh, please introduce yourself and the organization and then ask the question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Frickman. I'm the CEO of Drip Tech. We make affordable drip irrigation for small plot farmers. Very little discussion about water, uh, especially in light of uh, some of the recent um, you know, monsoon challenges in India. Um, I'm interested, how are we going to basically provide enough agricultural water to grow food for increasing populations across Asia and Africa. What is the question? The, the, the question is, um, there's not been too much discussion on, on water and irrigation. Uh, what are we going to do to ensure there is enough water and irrigation to help the, the burgeoning population um, you know, in countries like you know, India? No, see, in uh, India, there are certain parts of India which are, which are having plenty of water. But the southern and the western side of the country, we have a scarcity of water. So we are facing these problems. So there is one scheme of interlinking of rivers. So many of the states are going for interlinking linking of rivers to help the, uh, to solve the problem of irrigation, uh, water from the irrigation. But uh, this is the problem we are facing. And in the urban area, we require uh, quality water. So that quality water is not there. But in the bigger cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, we have been able to uh, uh, we have been able to address the issue of good quality of drinking water to the common man. But still, this is a big challenge for a country like India. And I said earlier, because there is a constraint of the public finance. And so we, we require more and more private, uh, private participation in all these infrastructure, uh, infrastructure projects. Wow. Oh, question. Sorry, Raymond, no, no, after so, you. Actually, I'm not an expert on water, but just as a consumer, and uh, uh, you mentioned agriculture. Um, actually, agriculture, great consumer of water, and manufacturing, great consumers of water. I think how to curtail wastage. I mean, you can apply technology. Um, I'm sure you know better than I do. I think from genetic modification of grains and all that, actually you can develop plants and grains that use water more efficiently, okay, or can grow uh, with less water. And uh, uh, certain countries are quite advanced in such things. For instance, Israel comes to mind. So it's really... Uh, better transfer of best practice or technology around. Um, personally, it may not be a fair thing to say because being an affluent person, um, um, that you don't worry about sort of quantity of consumption, okay? I think the world has been too focused on just quantity. Uh, you don't know, you can say a lot of praises of something like the Walmart business model but some business model that would enable anyone just to go into a shop on credit, buy 10 pairs of blue jeans. When I was in college, a pair of blue jeans lasted me for four years. Okay? Nowadays, any Tom, Dick, or Harry walks into a shop, they sort of, without thinking, without blink of an eye, they'll buy three, four pairs of blue jeans. Think about the water consumption. Think about the water pollution created by these blue jeans. I mean, I don't want to pick out denim manufacturers. I'm just saying that as an example. So in a way, the world does need to also, I think, educate consumers to go for more quality of consumption, less quantity. And at the same time, you still need to provide essentials or bring everyone's living standard up. That consumes water, okay? But if you think about jacuzzis, you think about 
huge flushing toilets and all that. I mean, it's things like this. The consumers themselves, especially the affluent people who, by per capita basis, are the biggest consumers of water, need to exercise discipline. Okay? And I'm not saying that that may have an immediate or short-term impact on profitability of certain businesses and all that. We don't want to see that happen. But technology and human ingenuity and entrepreneurship is such that if demand or consumer taste shift in some ways, there are other ways to meet that shift and be profitable. Uh, but I feel the affluent world is over-consuming. And we know that actually there are people who aspire to higher quantitative consumption still. Okay? A lot of people in China, in the emerging, especially the continental-sized economies, in China, in India, places like Indonesia, places in Africa. Yeah, I think it's the people with the know-how, people with the capital, people who are affluent need to think about these things. And then to how to raise the standard of living of those who are still aspiring while making maybe some sacrifices. You don't even need to make a lot of sacrifices. For instance, in China, I, I personally love to eat shark's fin a lot. I don't eat shark's fin no longer. Yeah. That's things like this. Need, people need to change. Thank you. There was a question in the back of the room. Yeah. I'm from Huaxia. My question is to Mr. Qian. Right now, in China, we are also working on the underground project. And NRD, NDRC also approved many uh, underground projects. But in recent years, we see rapid development of this sector in China. But they are also, uh, also means that some companies are uh, incurring losses. I know your MTR is also making uh, profit. So for the domestic companies, because they are not making profit, therefore the banks are not willing to make loans. So what are the suggestions from you? How can we improve? How can we learn from your practice? Thank you. I think for NDRC policy, uh, I really support this policy because I mentioned in my intervention that if the world economy is to go out of this kind of uh, slaggy economy, I think all of us need to adopt some of the Keynes' approach. That is, uh, he said, you need to spend money on infrastructure, on the human capital, and also on education. So these are very important measures. As I also mentioned, at the moment, people are trying to focus more on regulation and the financial intermediaries. They are constraining themselves for long-term loans. And also, many of the speakers also said that worldwide there are fund, funding resources. The Issue is how to encourage or how to have an enabling environment so that this kind of fund can be allocated to this kind of large-scale infrastructure, which are long-term investment. So in the long run, it can have a, or generate a very reasonable or reasonable return. And in terms of the risk, the risk may not be very high. When we talk about the risks, investors and businessmen, how do they look at the risks? They need to look at whether the government policy are stable or consistent. And also they need to look at, in the long run, whether the government or the country can win the support of the citizens. And if there is this kind of enabling investment environment, personally I feel that uh, we can find ways to find money for the project as long as there is a good project. And if the policies are far-sighted and also the environment are quite enabling and stable, therefore it is able to attract the fund. As has been said by Mr. Liu, that if the commercial banks, they are having difficulties of providing loans, then private equity or other types of a private equity can also engage in this kind of business. And also personally, I feel that in the next 10 years to come, insurance company, insurance sector can also 
make investment in infrastructure, and also they can have very good return if they make investment. I want to supplement. For the uh, underground project, it has a lot to do with the regulation and the uh, uh, monitoring environment. In China, by only selling the tickets, it is not possible for you to generate enough return. Actually, it has a lot to do with the land policy. But the po land policy in China is such the land for the underground project is also going through auctions. So this kind of use of the land and selling of the land is dislinked. The same is true for the water. Water also needs a supervising and monitoring environment and regulation. In China, we have a very big water project, and each year, the labor forces, the cost of which are on the increase, and other costs are on the increase, but the water price remains unchanged. So do we have an automatic adjustment mechanism learning from the pricing mechanisms of best practices in other countries? so that the price issue can be resolved. I think the infrastructure development needs the good and uh, involvement of the government. Thank you. Over there. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Juan Pocaterra. I am a global shaper from Venezuela. Um, basically, as a global shaper, well, I'm also a founder of a company called Grupo Intech Solutions. We develop intelligent transport systems for the local governments in Venezuela. Um, as a shaper, I have both a comment and, and a question for you. Uh, the comment would be, uh, you were tackling the issue of how to uh, involve or, or make available the possibility of private companies getting involved in infrastructure projects for mobility and transport, which is very difficult so, since it's a public good and, and mostly uh, it's a public sector that does investment. And I think, for example, our, our case in Venezuela has been the possibility of monetizing the data that comes out of that infrastructure in order to finance uh, further uh, in the implementation of uh, projects, large-scale projects. And that's a way to reduce costs on the infrastructure projects that you're uh, developing and also uh, bringing in the private sector uh, with the new technologies to do that. And second, the question would be, as a shaper, my concern would be on regards to the funding that you're talking about and the new financing uh, scheme that you're... That uh, has been setting up. Um, have you considered the possibility in those funds of investing in R&D for new actors in the infrastructure business and how much of that is dedicated to not only building new infrastructure but also making more efficient the one that we already have? That's a really a good set of questions. I wonder who would want to step up to that. Um, I wonder whether Mr. Liu, um, on, on the financing side, it's something that you might want to respond to. For the basic infrastructure, we really need to make the present infrastructure more efficient. Here comes two issues. The first, the existing basic infrastructure needs to be updated and renovated. We need funds. And also, it has to do with the bank's policy supporting policies from the banks in order to address the funding issue. For the banks, normally, we need a long-term loan from the banks. We sometimes need L&A uh, loans or technical innovation loans. But sometimes there is a mismatch. And also for the basic infrastructure investment, for example, the underground pipelines of water project in Beijing, the renovation of which is very difficult. You know, Beijing suffered from a big flooding in July the 21st. So it means there is a lot of work to be done and needs a lot of funding. Only relying on the government is not sufficient. Therefore, we need to mobilize the sources and funding from the society. But we also need to have a standardized uh, investment platform so that this kind of uh, uh, funding from different sectors of the society can enter into this uh, investment platform. So we need to allow them to enter and make investment. And also we need to have a platform. So this has a lot to do with uh, the regulation. Thank you. Uh, okay. I don't know if all your questions were a uh, answered, but what was your final question? I mean, I might try to... You know, the gentleman from Venezuela, yeah. 
，就是说，一旦有了这个基金以后，不光是说，哎，用这个基金来做新的基础设施，做新的基础设施，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做，做， The global economy, by various governments, by various cities, to continue to invest in infrastructure because it's a really good platform for you to accumulate human capital, and then you actually, through a particular infrastructure project, you can actually develop better know-how and better technology, applying new material and all that. So, I mean, it's a two-way street. So you don't even it, it, it's sort of like chicken and egg. Right, you don't necessarily have to invest in technology first because what it's done, a lot of especially applied R and D is driven by market prospects already. Okay, so what you need to do is that I think for governments now, especially this is the challenge facing all governments: Western government, Chinese government,、uh, emerging markets government, Hong Kong government, is that you have to have the gumption, you have to have the policy vision. And you have to ask what Chairman Liu had just said: the right kind of policies and regulation, and also for people who are actually managing the projects, you must have proper governance. Okay, because you've seen so many instances where 15, 20, 25 0 0 of the cream is skimmed off the top,、yeah. improperly. Okay, these are things that you really need to cut back, and that way you can, over the long term, maximize. Economic returns to the society, but coming back to this chicken and egg, I think you must undertake some of these what I call Keynesian measures these days, because what they'll do is that they would actually generate a lot of their own external economies that can be shared, and then by policy you can decide on how to allocate that. Okay, and R and D and new technology would be a beneficiary of that. I was just going to make. A, I think there's actually been some fairly specific research that's that's got going on, particularly in the area of power,、uh, smart grids.、Uh, that's really using the power of ICTs to make your power infrastructure much more efficient than it is today. So I think that there is some money going back into、um, R and D to see how you can actually utilise this infrastructure better, and and also in the area of spectrum. I know that there are a number of countries. Yes, Spectrum, I, I fully understand、uh, what, what you're talking about. But really and truly, Spectrum is a, it's a, nat- it's a national resource,、uh, and it is scarce. So there is always a tendency for governments to get as much as they can for Spectrum. But what, I, what we're seeing is that there is a big debate as to what you do with your Spectrum fees. But again, some of those Spectrum fees are going into investments、uh, in, in, the, in the ICT industry. They're going into actually、uh, rolling out infrastructure in the areas that are unviable or, or, or uneconomic,、uh, and also they, they're going into、um, some of those fees are going into、um, developing, again what I would call these integrated infrastructure projects. So to answer the question of the gentleman about not paying enough attention to water, what we're finding is that as you invest in these big infrastructure、uh, irrigation projects with dams and all of that. You can actually create mini power stations from those dams, so it's really getting the、uh, a, a double benefits, really, or collateral benefits from investing in one kind of infrastructure, but also getting the benefits from、uh, of another kind of infrastructure simply because of that investment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, I think that's interesting because I think、uh, we are also as companies and also as private sector have to think to operate in a different way, you know, and to create more efficient utilization of the infrastructure that we have. Again, on the telecom industry, I think we are started to look at, you know, how can we share infrastructure? You know, it had already started, you know, by sharing towers, for example, rather than everybody building his own tower, you know, for mobile communication. But more importantly, is now even to go and try to even share more, more on the active side, rather than building, you know, multiple networks. We can build one and then we compete on the services. So that's another way, you know, by which you know we can reduce the size of the investment. And yet, you know,、uh, and more or less compete, you know, in a way to provide the best service also for the customer. So that also would need, you know, for private sectors also to go and find new ways to operate and to find new business models by which, you know, they can go and efficiently use, you know, the resources that they have. Thank you.、Um, I think we have less than five minutes to go, so we probably need to do the summing up.、Uh, if I can ask each panelist, and we'll start with Raymond, we'll each panelist. 
to give us maybe 30 seconds um, on one idea, one thing that kind of stuck in their mind just coming out of this dialogue, this interaction, this question answer, um, and then we'll wrap it up. We'll start with Raymond. Yeah. Um, I think the basic, the fundamentals, what Chairman Liu just mentioned, I think government regulation is so important because it can be a disincentive, it can be a great incentive. You have to do it right. Okay? I think responsibility towards the environment, applying more technology towards water conservation, better use of water conservation. People all want to eat more food, more eat more nutritiously on agriculture. That's very important. And now it's really the challenge of how do you restore the strength and maybe a sense of mission and ethics of the financial intermediaries in which they can become truly productive again, where they're genuinely moving capital, where it would yield over the long term the highest economic benefit to society, the world. Okay. Um, I think, I hope that we have learned the lessons of 2008, and then we can really indeed move towards a brighter normal. But at the moment, the jury's still out. Thank you. Minister Johnson. Thank you. Um, I think what, what has stuck in my mind is really what the Deputy Chief Minister said in his opening uh, comments, and that was the fact that people don't want to pay for infrastructure. They see it as citizens see it as a it's, it's a, it's a right. This is what governments are, are supposed to do. And this is really where the, uh, the idea or the concept of targeted subsidies really comes into play. Uh, not everybody can afford this infrastructure, so there must be, instead of these broad burst subsidies that we tend to give, governments tend to give, it's really targeting it more at the people that really cannot afford to, to pay. Uh, you know, uh, if you're putting out infrastructure in rural areas, the data is not going to be as, the traffic isn't going to be as huge as what is coming out of urban areas. If you're putting irrigation or irrigation projects or dams in, uh, for rural farmers, it's not going to be as productive as mechanized farming. So it's really just finding that scientific way of, of ensuring that the subsidies are going to the people that need them and the people that can pay for that infrastructure are actually paying for the infrastructure, and we can actually then begin to roll out that infrastructure in a much more uh, uh, accelerated manner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Liu? Uh, I think uh, the first thing is that we need to break up the monopoly, and the government need to provide a better regulatory framework. In, in addition, we also need to allow the social capital to make investment in the infrastructure project. Thank you very much. Dr. Marav? Yeah, I believe that mobile technology is going to be disruptive and transformational at the same time, and that is going to bring rapid change. That actually needs, you know, for us to invest further, you know, to make sure that broadband and data is going to be available because we know that is going to impact many industries. I think the challenge which has been taken for a given that, you know, this is going to continue and the investment is going to be made. What I'm going to say that it is going to be a challenge for operator to continue to invest unless, you know, there is a clear, you know, understanding from the government and from regulators that they need also to help the operators, you know, to put this infrastructure together. So that's going to be a major challenge. Thank you very much, Mr. Oh, Modi. We require a skilled workforce. We lack a skilled workforce. And I think uh, uh, students for specializing in infrastructure. So it can become like a boom in IT as the, there is a boom in the IT industry. In the same way, there should be some courses, professional courses for the uh, skilled, how to improve or make available the skilled workforce. And the second point is regarding institutionalizing a regulatory framework. How to award the public-private partnership projects? How to award, how to prepare the documents? So this, uh, because in India we are having a regulatory framework for petroleum sector, for the telecommunication, but in different other sectors like road and other urban infrastructure, we require a regulatory framework and it should be institutionalized. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the stimulating discussion, panelists. There are three thoughts that popped up for me. Um, clearly getting public-private partnership right is going to be fundamental to, to solving the infrastructure issues, to dealing with the infrastructure issues uh, over the next uh, decade and more. Uh, Raymond, I love the idea, your, your notion of Keynes, in that the, the public sector and the governments are left to spend significantly 
to ensure we kind of pull ourselves out of this economic malaise uh, that, you know, even today in the news, that even countries like China uh, are potentially being dragged into. Uh, and this whole notion of the only way we're going to be able to do that if, if we put some kind of a user-based mechanism in place while at the same time providing a safety net for the most impoverished in, in the society to ensure they can consume these capabilities as well. Uh, thank you very much for the panelists, and thanks very much for the audience. I'm sure the discussion will continue. <laughs>